So hopefully you'll never need to set off one of these and then get a visit by one of those, but you've got a plan for emergencies. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the question of remote area communications, particularly for emergencies. So why do you need remote communications? Well, there's two main reasons. First one is general communications. That might start with work. Many people are working from home, aka caravan at the moment, hybrid working, uh, life generally, just researching stuff, socializing, that sort of thing. And also tracking, just to let your loved ones know where you are for their peace of mind and just in case you need help. The other reason is when you actually do need assistance in your journey, and that might be advice. I'm trying to fix my car. I'm not sure how to, what to do. I've got tools, a manual, etc., but I just need some help to actually get the job done. It could be information as, oh, I'm going to travel into this remote area. What's the weather conditions like? Do I need a permit, etc., etc.? Or it could be, worst case, I actually need a rescue. I, I need help to be taken out of the situation that I'm in. So lots of reasons for remote communications. Now, there's two categories. There's the systems which work anywhere in the world and there's the systems which are range limited. Now, best known of that is UHF radio. That is a form of citizens band radio. UHF um, is just a, a free to air anyone can use, but it is range limited. Now you do get repeaters which can bounce your signal over a mountain, but even so you can't rely on picking up a UHF radio and someone always hearing what you've got to say. Mobile phone, we know and love them, but um, there is not 100% coverage in Australia or the world. That may change, we'll come on to that later on. And there's also phone boosters which take a weak signal and amplify it. They cannot create a signal out of nothing. And examples of that is Telstra Go and Cellfire, and they tend to be network specific. Now, what we're more interested in in this presentation is emergency communications, and that means the stuff which works anywhere, starting with a satellite phone, distress beacons, smartphone hotspots, Starlink, satellite-based smartphones, satellite messengers or SENS, and HF radio. We're going to go through all of these in detail, except for HF radio, high-frequency radio. And the reason I'm not going to go into that in detail is it's pretty niche, pretty expensive, fantastic community and very useful. But if you're after a low-cost, simple, easy-to-use, very reliable system, um, HF radio isn't it. Those options are. So that's going to be the focus of what we're going to look at. Now, because those systems are satellite based, it is important to understand a bit about how satellite communications work because it is a bit different just to a normal phone tower. Now, here's essentially how it works. We've got the Earth, we've got a person over here with a sat phone, there's a satellite somewhere in orbit, sends a signal from the um, sat phone to the satellite, satellite sends it to a ground station and from there connects it to the voice and data network. That is satellite communication, very, very simple. Now there's three types and what we term constellations there, LEO, MEO and GEO, low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit and GEO is not is kind of high Earth orbit but that's geostationary so the satellite doesn't move relative to the Earth's surface and those constellations of satellites have got pros and cons which are important for your buying decision when you have a emergency uh, communication device you're looking at. So let's look at geostationary first, and this is kind of to scale. Here's the Earth. We've got the geostationary satellite about 35 kilometers, 35,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and it doesn't move relative to the Earth's surface. Now, because it's so high, you can kind of get away with maybe three or four satellites um, around the Earth's surface for more or less complete coverage, but you can see there's a problem here. If we don't have another satellite from this direction, we actually get a black spot of coverage there, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Then we've got the LEO, or low Earth orbit, and here we've got satellites which are much, much closer to the Earth's surface, and we really have to do a bit of a relay. So the sat phone signal will go to that satellite, that one, that one, that one, and then that would eventually get down to a base station. And that's your LEO or low Earth orbit, and that's um, more popular and can carry more bandwidth um, than the higher Earth orbits. And MEO is somewhere in, in between the two, but again, not geostationary. Now, here's the problem with geostationary satellites as far as remote travelers are concerned. So we've got person over here with a sat phone, another person over the sat phone, and a third one over there as well. Here we've got um, our satellite, and we're going to put a mountain in the way. Now you can see that if this doesn't move, we've got a black spot of, of coverage here. We simply can't get the coverage, and similarly, if we have a hole, then 
again, um, that geostationary satellite can't necessarily get coverage. Now the problem is worse when you're at the edges. If you're directly underneath the satellite, then you're okay. It's when you get to the edges of coverage that you may or may not get um, a, a problem. And the thing is, if you don't get coverage with a geostationary satellite, you'll never get coverage with it because it literally does not move relative to the Earth's surface. So um, either you're gonna get good coverage or not. So generally those systems work best if you're in this area here of good solid coverage, they don't work so well out to the edges and remember that is region specific and it is also dependent on a number of satellites if you get enough geo satellites it's not a problem um, so it really depends on on your use case okay now the leo solution to this so here we have um, satellites going around the earth and each one of these um, will have its coverage now because they're much closer to the earth's surface you need many more of them but the thing is they also move so as they move around here you will get coverage because eventually a satellite will come over um, and you'll get some form of coverage there um, it can be a problem if you've got a leo constellation there's very few satellites and they're unreliable that has been the case in the past but generally we get coverage now what it might mean is that the coverage could potentially come in and out you might need to wait for it for another satellite to come over and then um, give you coverage etc but at least if you wait you, you should be able to send a message and receive a message at some point so pros and cons of two different networks and um, you can see satellite map dot space what um, what uh, the iridium sorry the starlink uh, constellation looks like now here's an example of two coverage maps. Here's the Furea coverage map and the Iridium coverage map. Furea um, are a geo-based constellation, so they've got three satellites and those the coverage areas there. In Australia, what I found is towards the southern part of Australia, coverage is maybe not great, it's much better um, up towards the north in Queensland as you can kind of see there. Whereas Iridium, there's no problem with coverage anywhere in the world, quite a comprehensive LEO-based system. Okay, now let's cover what you need for emergency communications because this should kind of guide what you want. So always think about what you need, then look at what the options are. So the first thing is you've got to assume there's no car and this is where things like HF radio and Starlink fall down because in an emergency, you should assume that your car is on fire, upside down, burnt, or otherwise inoperable. You want it to be portable because you might need to walk a bit, take it to another vehicle, whatever the case may be. You don't want to lug something heavy around. You want it to be ease of use by others. And I like to, to chuck things, at, sat phones at uh, people at campsites and just say, call, call, um, uh, pretend someone's died or, or a bleeding and call for emergency, you find that these things are not as easy to use as you might think and they generally need instructions. You want it to be strong because in an emergency or in a crash it might have needed to survive um, a vehicle rollover, you might have dropped it in water, um, got dusty, it's got to be pretty strong and it's got to have a long battery life because you could be on the phone or sending messages for quite a long time or stranded for quite a while, you don't want to worry about battery life. And you want it to be reliable, you want to pick it up and then just know it's going to work and finally versatility ideally you'd want something which can give you um, text sometimes it's better just to text people particularly with numbers and sometimes it's better just for voice so ideally you want that kind of versatility there's pretty much no one device that covers everything but we're going to take a look at the pros and cons of several different ones so satellite phones then so these are very basic but robust phones and some people watching this video probably won't even be able to remember life before smartphones but some of people around my age will and remember how basic they were there was no touch phone there was well, I don't know if there's snake on these phones but they're really really basic they can send text but you've got to punch out individual keys there's no smartphone no keyboard there and you can make phone calls um, there's various networks you can either have them as a standalone unit or you can take your smartphone and slot them in, into a sleeve and make it one you may or may not get a local country number now what you can do with them you can have an sos function that's you just press a button bang and then emergency services come but you do need to set that up you can make phone calls text and sms and maybe you get incredibly slow data to the point where it's almost unusable but I've put it up there because it is kind of on the feature list, but it's not data as you and I would really know it. So the main advantages I think is robust and a long battery life, but unfortunately they're expensive to buy, um, generally well over a thousand dollars. They do require an ongoing subscription and plan. They can be difficult to use. You can't necessarily give one to someone and then expect them to use it. Um, this is where training in advance comes advance and they don't have the features of smartphones. They don't have all your contacts in there. They don't have your data. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to put that in. But um, I think if you're going to take one device 
with you out back. I think a smartphone is a really, really good choice. And I personally have a Iridium um, smartphone and that's my remote device unit um, of choice. And you may remember a while back, a family got stuck in the Simpson desert with their truck. Um, they set off a distress beacon, we'll come to that later on. What was the first thing that was dropped? A smartphone so they could talk, so there you go. Now let's talk about distress beacons. Now, one popular misconception is that people call these EPIRBs and they're not. There's three types of distress beacon which all fundamentally do the same thing. A PLB is really land oriented and can be um, carried by a hiker, for example. An ELT, that's a distress beacon which is for aviation and it's got certain things like crash detection, etc. And an EPIRB is one for marine use. Now you can take your EPIRB on land, etc. and that, that does work. So they all do fundamentally the same thing but three different use cases. So for land use, for all drive traveling it's a PLB that we want. Now when you press that button it sends a distress signal to international agencies, it's government controlled um, and some of them have got a digital display with something called RLS. It used to be just press the button and then hope because you wouldn't know for sure it's working. Now they've got displays and say yes we've got your location, um, use the GPS and um, it has triangulated location, it will give you confirmation of that. It will tell you that it sent the message and now with RLS or return link, link service the authorities can send a message back to your device and say yes acknowledged we've got your message. So that they've they've come on quite quite a long way and GNSS is the um, global navigation satellite system so that's how it triangul triangulates your your location. I would definitely buy one with RLS and GNSS because I think it's just worth the extra 150 or so dollars. So what can you do with it? Well Here's the disadvantage, they're one trick ponies, you can only send an SOS, right? So the advantage is they're very, very robust, very long battery life, five plus years, you buy one, that's it. The COSPAS SARSAS network, which is, this is the best network for emergency devices. It's, it's all government controlled, set up there, it's international agencies, it's just fantastic and um, there's no private enterprise to worry about. And there's no subscription, you buy it once and that's it. Um, you register it with AMSA in the case of Australia, I don't know what it is for other countries, and um, off you go. So AMSA, when you do your registration with your authority, they'd know who has that beacon, so when you press the button they go, oh yeah, it's Joe, and we know what Joe looks like, etc. and um, they'll contact your next of kin, this, that and the other, and then they'll um, confirm you're missing and then send the rescue services. And they're fairly inexpensive, only $500 um, in Australian, which is way cheaper than a sat phone, for example. Now, here's the big disadvantage of distress beacons, and that is they are for life-threatening emergencies only, and they're not bi-directional. So, you can't use them to get a bit of advice or say, look, I'm not sure how to fix this on my vehicle. Should I do this? Should I do that? Or I'm going to be running a bit like, all you can do is say, I'm in a life-threatening situation and you press that button. That's it. There's no granularity and that's its biggest disadvantage and you can't, there's no real bi-directional communication, just an acknowledgement. So I kind of view these as a good backup device. Um, because often in four-wheel driving you just need some help and information as opposed to come get me, I'm, I'm in real trouble. So I think this is the cheapest and most robust solution but only for dire emergencies. Now we've got satellite messengers and these are essentially handheld devices which don't offer voice. Um, they're also called SENS or satellite emergency notification devices. They're generally for hiking sat nav. Garmin do a range um, of technology called InReach which they integrate into their GPS receivers or GNSS receivers which have got hiking maps etc. Um, and they're pretty small and portable and robust and some of them have got a built-in um, keypad and some of them can integrate with your smartphone so you can use your smartphone to to type a message and then send it. So you can do SOS again, because I've got an SOS button, you press that and the emergency services come. Um, they can do text, they can do tracking, so you know they'll send a message every X many hours, etc., or minutes um, to tell people where you are, and often they can be used for navigation, weather forecasts, things like that. They are pretty robust, they are designed to be outdoors, they've got a pretty long battery life, um, you can do tracking, navigation, and possibly Bluetooth integration to your smartphone as well. So handy devices. The disadvantages are they require a subscription, and that subscription varies depending on how much you're going to use it. Maybe you can pause it, maybe you can't. Um, and there's no voice, so you can't talk to people. All you can do is send, send text. But again, a, a handy point here. So I think that these are actually quite a good device for your single emergency comms. Um, there's no device which is perfect. The only perfect way to do it is to carry multiple. 
Then we've got smartphone hotspots, and there's two in particular here, the Iridium Go and the Zolio. So these are two-way messengers, but they're really kind of reliant on smartphones, although they've both got SOS buttons. So you can do your SOS, your texting, tracking, um, the Zolio does tracking, not the Go. The voice, um, the Go does voice, but the Zolio does not. And because it's connected to a smartphone, you've got all your smartphone features there. Um, the d disadvantage is re re uh, requires a subscription, and it is largely reliant on a smartphone for most of its features. And the problem with a smartphone is the battery life isn't very long, and it's not very robust. You crack it, and you're going to have a problem operating it. So relying on a smartphone for emergency comms, I think, is fraught with, with, with danger. Um, and it then becomes two devices to carry and use, as opposed to just one. And that's complexity you don't really need when you're in an emergency situation. So I would seriously consider buying a satellite messenger, as on the previous slide, with a smartphone instead of, of one of these. Okay, now we've got smartphone sat direct. And what I'm talking about here, the first one off the market is the Apple iPhone 14. So this is the SOS function for Apple phones only. It's Apple at the moment, Android will, will come in the future. I want to make it really clear, this is not full smartphone data. I'm going to come to that in a moment, but for the moment, all it is, is just SOS and the phone will actually send your details to the, to the Apple call center. That's all it is. It is not your smartphone giving you all your data and voice via satellites. So the beauty of this is it's your smartphone. You know how to use it. You're not going to have a problem using it in an emergency. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Um, the smartphones aren't robust or long life. We've just covered that. There's limited features. And remember, it's just not the full phone feature. It is free for the moment. They will charge for it in a couple of years. But for the moment, um, I think it's a really great feature, but it's not something that I would be relying on. And the way it works is it doesn't work in all countries at the moment. It does work in Australia. When your smartphone, your iPhone 14 Plus goes out of coverage, what it will do, it will pop up a little satellite icon and then that be, um, is your signal to say, yeah, okay, we can now do SOS function for um, Apple smartphones. And then I've got another video where I talk through a bit more about how this works. And now we come to the big satellite and mobile phone myth, which is this. Your mobile phone does not connect to satellites, at least not yet. Now I've seen this myth repeated by the police, the Australian Defence Force and the SES. And I believe it's also been in some of their training materials. And it goes like this. If you're making an emergency call, triple zero, and your phone cannot connect to the mobile network, then somehow it will connect to the satellite systems and you can make that call that way. That is not correct. It is wrong. At some point it will be true in the future, but as of October 2023, it is wrong and the closest thing to it is the Apple system, which I've um, just described. So a couple of points where I think this has sort of um, arisen from. First is there's a number called 112, which is the international code you can put in any uh, mobile phone anywhere in the world, and that will route you to your local emergency services. So there's different emergency numbers, 000, 999, 911, depending on the country, and there's more. Uh, 112 works everywhere. The other point is that um, you can actually pick up any mobile phone, and I encourage you to try this now, pick up your mobile phone, lock it because you've probably got a pin code on there but don't, don't unlock it make sure it's locked and then you'll notice that there's actually on it a area where you can say emergency calls only and you can make an emergency call without unlocking the phone that's really important now that doesn't necessarily work for sat phones which is why you shouldn't leave your sat phones um, with, with a pin code or any emergency system but it does work for mobile phones now, there's also something called camp on. So let's say that you're out in the bush and um, you've got an Optus phone and you're, you need to make an emergency call, but you're not with, within range of Optus service, but you are within range of Telstra service. Your phone will, if it's got the hardware to do it, use the Telstra network to allow you to make that call, and that's called camp on. And I think that's maybe where this confusion has come in with this myth about satellites and phones, etc. Now, on the subject of phones, there's also now something called AML or advanced mobile location. So when you are making an emergency services called a triple zero, the operator can basically press a button and then your phone will, will switch on its GPS receiver. 
if it hasn't already done so, it will gather its location and then it will send an SMS message to the emergency services with your exact location and that's AML so you don't need to worry about your location exactly. So that's a bit about sat phones and mobile phones. Now satellite smartphones, now there's two types. So this is the Fureo XT Lite and that is a phone which has got a normal SIM card in it as well as a satellite SIM card and it normally operates off the GSM network 3G, 4G, 5G although 3G is about to be uh, disbanded in, in Australia but where it can't get reception off normal mobile phone networks it will switch automatically to satellite so that's an option for you i'm personally not wild about it because it's not a very good phone by modern standards it's not a modern smartphone but you know it's an option for you this is a smartphone sleeve so it looks like this normally you put your phone in it and then it be turns your a smartphone into a sat phone and then you've got all of your contacts details etc now your data applications aren't going to work because you're not going to get the sort of bandwidth needed for them to work but you will have contact to most things i'm not a massive fan of these because it's too they're kind of specific to each um, type of smartphone for, for starters but also you're then relying on your smartphone which is not a robust device with a long um, service life so I'd prefer to do a Bluetooth sync to something like a messenger instead but it is an option so um, not my favorite options. Now let's talk about Starlink and Starlink is super fast internet designed for buildings and also now travelers and it is not designed for emergencies. I want to make that really clear this is not an emergency system. So all it does is give you internet access that is it but that's a great thing. So it, internet access but anywhere in the world. I mean initially two years ago there were coverage spots, coverage black spots but now all of Australia is covered, most of the world is covered etc etc. Some places uh, even in Australia are now getting saturated with coverage um, but you know that's not going to be a problem if you're traveling remotely. This, this is why you can't use Starlink as your emergency system. The first thing it's bulky and heavy. It's really big um, compared to something like a smartphone or distress beacon. You can't go walking and running away from a vehicle with your, with your Starlink in your hand. It relies on 240 volt AC unless you're one of these clever people that have hacked it for 12 volt and you know that's not a power source you're going to find readily available in the bush. With a smartphone or a sat phone or a messenger you can potentially recharge that off a small solar panel you cannot possibly do that off, off Starlink. It's not portable um, you, you, you've got to put it in a big bag you've got to take it places it's no good and it's fragile. If your vehicle rolls or burns I mean good, good luck Starlink surviving that so it is not an emergency communication system but it is a great auxiliary to it so let's say that you are stuck or you've got a problem there and if you've got a bit of time and Starlink's working you can fire it up and then you've got high-speed video link to people which is fantastic if you want help you can show people exactly what's happening you can get in touch with friends and family so it's, it's fantastic as an auxiliary but don't carry Starlink alone and think yeah that's what I'm going to use in the event of emergency because it's just not suitable a sat phone or a messenger is much much better. So I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. You can pause the video and then take a, a, a look at it. But here's my view as to the pros and cons of each one. So for voice calls, sat phone and Starlink will do that. Potentially your, your sat phone um, sat Wi-Fi hotspot as well. You won't get it off a messenger, certainly not off a distress beacon and satellite smartphone. Um, not at the moment, that's the Apple system. Texting, they pretty much all do texting apart from the distress beacon again. Data, really if you want data as we know of normal smartphones the only option is Starlink and that, that's fantastic um, for it. Um, SOS, pretty much all do that again Starlink doesn't. Sat phone, gen pretty much all the newer ones do but the older ones may maybe not and Starlink doesn't have that. Portability, they're all pretty portable except for Starlink that's horrifically non-portable. I'm giving these kind of a zero um, for semi because because anything, anytime that's um, a bit bigger and bulky, there's two devices here, so it's not as portable as the single devices. Robustness, um, anything that relies on a smartphone is not, in my view, robust. It's too easy to damage, it's not waterproof, it doesn't float, um, it's too easy to crack the screen, etc. And Starlink is definitely not. So what should you use it for, for when? If, you've, if you're in a life-threatening situation, the best device to have if it's all gone horribly wrong and you want to be rescued ASAP, the best thing you can have is a distress beacon. You hit that button, you don't worry about it anymore. It's really simple and it goes to the world's best network, Cospas Sarsat, 
for getting help to you. That is the strength of the distress beacon and it's better than anything else at that one function. Um, for tracking, well, um, lots of things we do tracking. The smart sat phone, maybe. Messengers typically tend to do it. Starlink won't do that, and the others maybe, maybe not, but Messenger's generally quite good at it. Um, internet access, if that's what you want, Starlink's the only option. And general advice, keeping in touch. Well, the sat phone's really good for that because you can text and you can do voice. Messenger you can only send um, voice and Starlink can obviously be really good as well because then you've got full internet access, you can research things and ask questions on Facebook, etc. So that's really good. So you kind of need a bit of a mix. Now some extra phone tips, and this is just for your mobile phone, not that I'm suggesting that should be your emergency comms device, but um, as a general point here. So battery, your battery on your smartphone doesn't last a long time at the best of times, but when you're remote it lasts even less time because the phone is desperately trying to reach a far off um, phone tower. So the tip is put it into flight mode, turn the screen down, and then it won't be using up its battery doing all the data stuff, giving your personal data to Facebook and Google and trying to reach that, that tower, so, so do that. And if you do need to use your phone, turn data off or even better, um, just leave it in flight mode. Now, the other thing is send, if you need to communicate, send a text from your phone, because that's more chance of getting through than data um, so, by systems such as WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, send a text, that's a good way to do it. Um, and then go as high as you can. So phones are kind of what we say height is might, so the higher you get the better. If you can just get a little bit um, you know, even 10 meters higher than normal, that can help. Sometimes people even tie their phone to a drone, send a drone up or put it in, in a tree and, and drag it up the tree. And, and you know, just it, height can really make a difference. And you can actually go dual SIM with some phones and an eSIM. So it's where you've got maybe your Telstra SIM as your primary, um, but you've got an Optus SIM as well in there. So the phone will generally use Telstra where it can. If it can't get Telstra, it will go to Optus. So you've got options in, um, in there. So Telstra is the best generally, but there are places where Telstra doesn't work and Optus did. When I was last in William Creek, that was the case, for example. I was really shocked to find my Telstra phone didn't work and annoyed to find my companion's Optus phone worked. I don't know if that's still the case, but there'll be other examples. Now, some general tips here. If all of this stuff is, is hard to use, particularly in a time of stress. So please, please, please use it before you actually need it. And my favorite thing to do is go on a campfire, give someone a sat phone and say, make a call. And they don't realize they've got to pull, pull the antenna out and maybe it's international call. And it's just different. You know, for anyone under 30, they're looking at it like it's a museum piece. So use it and, and practice. Use it, put the Emergency Plus app if you're in Australia, really good app, I won't go into two details now, but probably one for your own country as well. Now, people talk about GPS coordinates, there's no such thing. There's coordinates which are provided by GPS, or more correctly, the global satellite systems now. Um, there's UTM and three different notations of lat long. So get a passing familiarity with what they're like so you've got some clue what they look like. You don't need to be an expert in it. Um, what three words? That's another really handy thing to learn here. If actually some really clever people have divided up the entire globe into tiny sections of a few metres each and they've um, basically given three words, in this case um, float palace kick to the top of the Westgate Bridge on Melbourne or one part of it there. And then all you need to say rather than the complicated uh, Latin long, you just say, oh, I'm at Float Palace Kick. It's, it's a really, really good system. You should be aware of that and put that on your, on your phone as well. Um, and generally also use offline apps because so many apps these days use the internet and depend on the internet. Of course, it's no good. You're going to assume that you don't have internet coverage. So make sure your apps work offline, which you can do by turning off data and Wi-Fi. Um, and remember, some systems offer off the weather and other features. I have generalized somewhat here. This is a fast moving space. You do need to look at the specific features and could kind of take what I've said as a general rule and principles and guidance and then look at the specific models as they come on, onto the market. And remember again, learn your kit, so important. Now here's the big, big change, which is frightening and exciting and interesting and all sorts of these things, but here it is, right? So Starlink, the people, or rather SpaceX, the people that made Starlink, have said they are going to have the ability to connect every single mobile phone, and that is without any extra hardware on a mobile phone, to the satellites. I'll say that again. Your mobile phone, without any extra hardware, will be able to work as a sat phone. Not now, not today, but it's coming. Um, 
So text is going to be starting 2024, voice and data 2025, and um, Internet of Things um, a bit later. That's what they're saying. So when that happens, that is game changer is an understatement for the magnitude of this change, because then you will have much less need to carry a smartphone and you know probably Starlink itself the dishes may maybe they won't be needed to the same degree anymore um, who knows but it hasn't happened yet um, and they've got dates will it happen by that date don't know there's probably a lot of technical problems but they've they're confident enough to say it's going to happen so massive massive game changer all right, now I'm going to finish off with some basic purchasing advice. So consider what, should, what could go wrong situations. If you're always traveling with other people, that's different from if you're solo travel. And, um, you know, use different systems to your traveling companion. So if you own an Iridium sat, sat phone, there's no point your traveling companions buying an Iridium sat phone. They should buy a Furaya sat phone or um, a Spot Messenger or something like that, something different on a different network so you've got that redundancy. And use multiple systems as, as well. I think that's important. And again, I can't emphasize it enough. Please learn them. The amount of times I've been out in the bush and people have been pulling new kit out, GPS receivers, this, oh, I don't know how to use it, etc. It's, it's not the time we're in an emergency. Um, and research carefully because of major generalizations here. You've got to go through feature list by feature list and really understand it. Now, here's my generalized advice. So as a primary device, I would choose a sat phone or a messenger. And I would, if you can, back it up with a distress beacon. I think if you've got those two, you've got two separate ways of communicating. This is for advice and information. And this is for oh my god, right, that's it, we need to call everything in. And, you know, there's a bit of overlap between the two. But I feel that's quite a good system for people to have. I'm less keen on the Apple phone because of its robustness, but I think if you've got an iPhone, iPhone 14, I think it's fantastic, but it's not something I necessarily want to rely on at this point. And Starlink, um, that's a fantastic auxiliary, but again, it's not something you go, oh, that's my major system there. And I'm less keen on the sat phones, um, sat phone hotspots and the, and the combined system as well. So I hope you found this video useful. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments and thank you for watching.